and the recipient of the 2015 uh, Joseph Grinnell uh, Medal of the Museum of Vertebrate Zoology. So this medal uh, was established in 1983 and named after the founding director of the MVZ, Joseph Grinnell, uh, and it's awarded roughly every five years. And the description of the kinds of people to whom this is awarded, uh, what we look for are uh, typically senior investigators who exemplify a commitment to natural history research and are making fundamental empirical and conceptual contributions to ecology and evolutionary biology. And today's speaker certainly uh, meets all of those uh, descriptions. So, and that description of the award really reflects uh, uh, the founding director of the museum, Grinnell himself, uh, who was very committed to natural history research, had a very active research uh, program in the field, uh, but also was thinking deeply about fundamental conceptual issues uh, in, in both ecology and, and evolutionary uh, biology. Past recipients of this award have included uh, George Bartholomew, Jim Brown, David Wake, Peter and Rosemary Grant, who you all saw last week, uh, and Michael uh, Ryan. Uh, so uh, today's speaker, uh, Dr. Bob Rickliffs, uh, is a very uh, illustrious uh, company there with the, the past recipients. The selection process was that uh, we solicited nominations nationally and internationally. Uh, and the faculty of the MVZ then, then uh, met and discussed these and, and chose the recipient. And uh, I have to say, we received many nominations, and uh, the people that were nominated read like a who's who uh, list in of uh, major figures in ecology and evolution. And yet our discussion was straightforward and short, because uh, against this uh, impressive group of, of people, uh, we all agreed uh, that uh, Bob Rickliffs was uh, the most deserving uh, of, of this award. <laughs> now, I, I think it's also interesting that Bob shares many similarities with, with Grinnell. Uh, like Grinnell, he, was an he is an ornithologist. Grinnell was an ornithologist. Uh, he has had an active field program for uh, many, many years. Uh, he has a commitment to natural history research. And like Grinnell, uh, he has addressed fundamental conceptual issues in our, in our field. Grinnell, as many of you know, is often credited with the concept of the ecological niche. And, and Bob's own work has uh, developed this in, in, in many interesting directions. Um, he's a native Californian. Uh, he grew up in Marin and then uh, the Monterey Peninsula. And he says that it's changed a lot. I guess Marin has changed a lot. It's more expensive than it was then. Uh, he went to Stanford University, which I guess we won't hold against him. <laughs> Uh, and then he did his graduate work at the University of Pennsylvania with Robert MacArthur uh, before MacArthur uh, moved to, to Princeton. Uh, he was then uh, at the Smithsonian Tropical Research Institute for one year uh, before uh, joining the faculty of the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, and I was looking at his CV today and I calculated from his birth date to when he started as an assistant professor. And I just confirmed this with him, and he asked me not to mention it, but I'm going to anyway. <laughs> <laughs> that he was 25 years old when he started as a professor. So for all of you graduate students who are, and he remained at Penn uh, uh, until he moved to the University of Missouri uh, 20 years ago. Now, by any measure, he has made very deep and broad contributions to many fields. I, I can't possibly stand up here in a short time summarize uh, his many, many contributions. He has published hundreds of papers, including many papers that have been cited hundreds or thousands of, of times. Uh, he has received many awards, too numerous uh, to mention, uh, but uh, among them was elected into the National Academy uh, in 2009. The broad themes in his work include uh, work on biogeography, especially insular biogeography, uh, more generally understanding the processes and, and factors that are governing the distribution and abundance of organisms in communities. He's had an abiding, long interest in, in life history, uh, including uh, senescence. He wrote a book uh, on aging. Uh, 
And uh, more recently, uh, I think this is going to be part of uh, today's talk, judging from the abstract uh, disease ecology. Uh, so those are some of the main themes, but he's, he's worked really in, in very many areas. And probably many of you know him uh, from his book. So this textbook in ecology, this is uh, my copy of the uh, first edition, which was published in 1973. Uh, when he was uh, still a young, young professor. Uh, and this, I think, has been uh, a seminal work uh, now in many editions that really helped define a, a, a field. The best textbooks do that. They, they define a field. And I, I just wanted to read to you the very first sentence from this book, uh, because I think it's uh, illustrative of his work. I think it's an accurate description of the field. And it gives you a feel for how broadly he views uh, ecology, how broadly he viewed it in 1973, and I think appropriately the way it's helped define how the, the field is, uh, is viewed now. So this is just the first sentence from his, his textbook from 1973. Mating calls of toads, potassium cycles in forests, genetic equilibrium between selection and mutation, energy budgets of pond organisms, pollination systems of plants, predator-prey population oscillations. All of these phenomena fall within the realm of ecology. So that's a very broad view that includes population genetics and how organisms function in their environment in, in many different ways. So uh, I, I think that uh, that's a, a beautiful conception of the field, and it's one that uh, influenced me when I uh, first read this textbook as a, uh, as a graduate. To. When you talk to people about Bob Rickliffe's, uh, as I've done over the last couple of days in anticipation of this visit, uh, there are two things that, that, that people say. One is, well, he's just made amazing seminal contributions to the field, and what an intellect. Uh, so there's this recogni recognition of, of what a powerhouse he's been scientifically. But then the other thing everybody says, and he's about the nicest guy in the world. Uh, and uh, he, uh, he, he has this uh, well-deserved reputation of being open and interactive uh, and, uh, and, and uh, very friendly. I know the students enjoy meeting with him uh, today. So uh, for all of these reasons, uh, I am very pleased to present uh, today uh, the Joseph Grinnell Medal. And let me just hold this up. It's an actual medal. <laughs> So here's, here's the actual medal uh, and uh, the certificate. So I'm uh, very happy to present these to uh, Bob Rickliffe on behalf of uh, the Museum of Urban Zoology. So, uh, So I would like to talk about 
just some recent thoughts about ecology and natural history. And we can get these to uh, the middle words. Technology. Oh, yeah. OK, so there are a couple of things that I want to talk about, a couple of concepts. One of them is the concept of the regional community, by which I mean simply that interactions and processes occurring over large geographical space affect the local outcome of species distributions and the composition of communities at any given point in space. That all of these are dependent upon not only local interactions that species are having, but also on the processes which are occurring in much larger areas. So that's one of the ideas. And the other one is intrinsic dynamics of regional communities. And by intrinsic dynamics, I mean that the interactions among populations within, especially coevolutionary interactions, and I'll talk more about this later on, set up a dynamic that leads to continuing change within communities, even in the absence of environmental change. So these are ideas. There's a lot of circumstantial evidence, uh, not a lot of direct evidence, but I hope that you might find these ideas compelling to some degree. I mean, in ecology, we trace a lot of our thinking. Uh, a lot of the history of the field goes back to some of the early figures. Darwin is no exception. And he certainly emphasized the fact to all of us that the patterns that we see in nature, all these wonderful forms, all the interactions that occur there, are the product of processes going on around us all the time, which means that we have the capacity to understand how nature has come to be the way it is by investigating these processes themselves. And this is pretty much what set people on the path which we're now following in sort of trying to understand what is going on in natural situations. I don't know if any of you have been to Darwin's house southeast of London. How many here have been have actually been there? It's kind of not quite a few. It's, it's a it's really a pilgrimage spot, I think, revolutionary violence. And also for ecologists, Darwin lived out the last 40 years of his life there. Uh, all of his greenhouses and experimental plots. And it's, it's really a, a wonderful place. At the, at the lower edge of the property, there's this uh, famous sand walk, which he called his thinking path. And Darwin used to walk around this uh, periodically and, 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 and felt inspired by, by being out of nature and walking around here. I've on several occasions walked around this path, but it didn't do anything. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I've had to conclude that it really was the man and not the path. <laughs> but a lot of, a lot of uh, things that we think about today in terms of how natural systems are structured, we need to trace back to Darwin. And this is one of, I think, the, the, the more uh, important things which he said. He said it's uh, closely aligned forms that generally come in to the severest competition with each other. And consequently, each new variety of species during the progress of its formation will generally press hardest on its nearest kindred and tend to exterminate them. Sounds an awful lot like competitive exclusion uh, to me. And of course, Grinnell. I mean, Grinnell was just fantastic. I mean, uh, his heritage has just, has just been great. So he's <coughs> talking here about uh, two species that uh, have approximately the same food habits, not likely to remain long, evenly balanced in members in the same region. One will crowd out the other. Sounds very much reminiscent of, of Darwin. And certainly, this is a, a statement of the competitive exclusion principle very early on. That uh, Grinnell really understood that species that are very similar ecologically are unlikely to coexist in the same place for any length of time. And later on, his very famous paper published in 1917 on the interrelationship of the California Thrasher. Uh, emphasize, uh, in particular, the kinds of physiological and also psychological aspects of the California, I guess, <laughs> <laughs> to, to these narrow range of environmental conditions. And these were the, the, the kinds of conditions that this particular bird uh, could exist in in a, in a uh, suitable population. And he says it's axiomatic that those two species regularly establish in a single fauna precisely the same niche relationships. So in a sense, I think that Grinnell really outlined very early, 100 years ago, a lot of the precepts that we take for granted now in terms of community 
ecology theory. So a remarkable, absolutely remarkable person. It was the same year that uh, Grinnell published his Thrasher paper that Tansley uh, did some fabulous experimental work on competition in bed straw plants. And shortly after that, Gauza, of course, did the kind of experiments with paramecium that we all teach to students in uh, undergraduate classes. And so at this time, really, the modern aspects of population and community ecology were being extremely uh, well established. And during the latter, during the middle part of the last century, uh, a number of very prominent figures, including David Lack and Hutchinson and Robert MacArthur, who I had the, the really the real distinct privilege of working with for a couple of years, uh, sort of solidified this whole idea of, kind of evolutionary ecology and community ecology based on these ideas about competitive interactions limiting the occurrence, the coexistence of species within a particular area. And so we we have a, a typical publication about MacArthur's warblers. Everybody knows about MacArthur's warblers. He wondered how five species, which morphologically and behaviorally are very, very similar to one another, could coexist, live together in the same spruce forest in New England. And so he went out and he looked at these birds in some detail and discovered that they partition the resources there by feeding in different parts of the spruce tree. So whatever it is about their psychology or whatever else, <laughs> they seem to prefer to forage in different parts of the spruce trees, avoiding strong competition with each other and enabling them to <coughs> coexist. Um, oops. Yeah. So this is one of the illustrations of data which you put together for this uh, particular paper. I emphasize to my students, of course, that this was done as a part of a PhD uh, project and brought him instant, I think, recognition uh, at that time as one of the leading population community ecologists. And so later this sort of this basic natural history gave way to a lot of theoretical developments, uh, including this concept of limiting similarity uh, by MacArthur and Levins and going on to community matrices by Bob May and others. And again, sort of really solidified the idea in the ecological thinking that comp competition among species was limiting coexistence of species, very much in the way that Darwin had postulated. And so we see these kinds of textbook uh, illustrations of the distribution of resource use along some kind of an axis of either food types or other <coughs> ecological conditions, and that species are partitioning the niche space which is available to them, and no two species can get to be too close or overlap too much without one of them excluding the other. So this view then, first of all, it's, it's, it's an old view. I mean, we can, I, I'd love to go back to these old uh, publications and, and see what some people had to say about this. So Wallace said, if a continent is fully stocked with animals, then so long as no change takes place, no new species will arise. So Wallace had also a concept that a region could become saturated with species. It could be fully stocked. There was no room to put any more species into it. So these are old ideas. Now at the same time, and it's kind of interesting that these two <coughs> concepts of being ecologically filled uh, on the one hand and not being able to accommodate more species uh, came at about the same time as the equilib equilibrium theory of island biogeography. Because in that theory, there is explicitly an external, say, a regional factor, namely colonization of new species to islands, which determines the number of species along with uh, the size of the island, the number of species that can coexist on a particular island. So here we have a situation in which it isn't sort of the local coexistence being determined by competitive interaction so much, but that this can be influenced by an extrinsic sort of regional factor, which is this rate of colonization. And yet these two weren't really put together uh, very much. Island biogeography pretty much stayed apart from uh, community ecology within large continental areas. There was, during the, say, 1980s or so, or even a little bit earlier than that, there was a fair amount of work which seemed to indicate that the local diversity that one could find on any particular plot uh, 
was related in some way to the overall regional diversity, suggesting the correspondence between the two. And so this is work uh, which uh, George Cox and I did in the Lesser Antillean Islands, a bunch of different islands of different sizes, uh, which have, this is the mainland in Panama, where there are a lot of species within this uh, regional diversity. And then you look at the uh, species per habitat, the local diversity, and you can see there is a fairly good correspondence between this. So there's a connection between the regional diversity in this situation and the local diversity in this situation. And this was being increasingly uh, pointed out at about that time. Along with this, we also see the impacts of competition, though, because as you increase the number of species within the large region, both the number of the local habitats which are being used, which are these open circles here, and the local abundance within those habitats, indicated by these point counts, are decreasing. So clearly, competition is important, but in this case, it isn't necessarily limiting the number of species that occur locally. And there is this correspondence then uh, between local processes and regional processes which are interacting to determine species richness. Well, there's been a lot of work trying to characterize species richness over the surface of the globe. Uh, for example, Willem Barthlog at the University of Bonn in Germany put together these uh, species distribution maps for plants, and as you can see, what we know for most organisms, which what's also been known for hundreds of, or a hundred or more years, a couple of hundred years since von Humboldt anyway, that species richness is highest in the tropics compared to uh, higher latitudes, that it's, you tend to find more species where it's warm, where it's wet, and where there are high mountains. So these patterns have been known for a long time, and there have been a number of studies which have related the local diversity that one finds within a forest plot or within some small constrained space to other aspects of the environment. Because one of the ideas, of course, is that if local processes are constraining the number of species that can coexist locally, that there should be some direct correlation between species richness and physical aspects of the local environment. And so you take a number of things like uh, potential evapotranspiration, number of wet days, topographic uh, vegetation analyses, structure, and so forth, and you get pretty good high significance, and you can explain a lot of the variation in diversity locally, which reinforces this idea that the outcome of interactions among species is uh, varying depending upon the local, physical, and other conditions of the environment. So there's been quite a a number of studies of this sort which have shown these close correlations between attributes of a local environment and the number of species that are coexisting. But there, of course, are also exceptions. And I always, uh, sort of the natural history thing is to recognize exceptions and to think about what they might indicate. Uh, mangroves are not a favorite habitat to be in, but they're a favorite example in some ways. Because this habitat exists all over the tropical earth shallow, uh, soft sediments, uh, close to coastlines. And if you go into the New World tropics and look at the diversity of mangrove plants, there are about four genera, maybe seven species, depending on how you split them up uh, in this kind of a, in, environment. If you go to the same environments in Northern Australia and Indonesia, what you find are 17 genera and 42 species, many of which would be found in the same local area. So here you have identical, in most senses, environments, but a tremendous difference in the diversity of the communities which are developing in those areas. And this has not been analyzed very well. Uh, it almost certainly has to do with the, both the origin of new mangrove lineages from terrestrial uh, tree species and also the diversification of lineages within the mangroves, but very little has actually been uh, said about that to, to sort of analyze this so-called diversity anomaly. A little bit more is known about uh, variation in diversity of temperate trees. Uh, if you compare very similar environments in North America, in Europe, and in Eastern Asia, where you can match climate conditions reasonably well, uh, you find a relative paucity of species in Europe, which has been related to the cooling climates during the later part of the tertiary and the southern movement of these tree species in response to climate change, but there's no place to go in Europe because you've got the 
Alps and the Mediterranean Sea, and so extinctions recorded in the fossil record have been very high. Uh, in Eastern Asia, which is extremely diverse even compared to North America, uh, the climate cycles didn't bring on such pronounced glacial cycles. There was plenty of room to the south for species to move, and the diversity of these forests wasn't impacted anywhere near the degree that it was in uh, North America and Europe. So here again, another situation where the climates are actually reasonably well matched. Many of the same genera of plants are occurring in these forests, and yet the diversity is extremely different because of the history of these forests within the large regions within which they occur. Each of these regions has a distinctive characteristics. You can just look at a map of these two different areas. These are climate zones in eastern North America and in eastern Asia, or North America and Asia. As you can see, eastern North America with these deciduous forests is basically boring. Um, it's uh, very, very uniform across here compared to Eastern Asia, where there's all kinds of heterogeneity in the climate zones. These land areas were connected and separated several times by sea level rise. There's a much greater connection of temperate forests to the tropics in Asia than there is in this area in North America. And so all of these differences are contributing not only to the regional diversity of these forests across the entire continent, but also to the local diversity of these forests within a small area. And so the way I like to look at sort of the regional community is that we have axes of environment and geography in this direction. Species are distributed across these. These species are being produced largely within large regions through uh, various kinds of evolutionary diversification. There may also be immigration of species. And then within these areas, each species is occasionally expanding its distribution, it's contracting its distribution, it may lead to uh, allopatric isolated populations and so forth. But this is a continually changing situation. And the local community that we look at in our backyard can be imagined as sort of dropping a pin through this. And whatever species happen to be in that particular pinpoint are going to be the species that make up the local community. And so one, one wants to understand how local diversity is determined, one needs to look much more broadly at the regional context. So I've been very interested in how species are filling ecological and geographic space. And this gives some hints as to some of the processes that might be related. So this is a uh, complicated figure in some way, but actually it's quite quite simple. What we're doing here is a taxonomically nested analysis of variants. Reviewers don't like these things anymore. If your students don't do this, do some phylogenetically corrected type thing. Um, but anyway, the point is that the total variance in these are number of sites occupied. These are forest bird species, the average density within sites, total density over eastern North America. And these are various uh, ordination uh, things all related to the distribution and abundance of bird species in eastern North American forests. So these top nine graphs refer to distribution and abundance. These are morphological uh, principal components. But what you can see in this nested analysis of variance is that the amount of variation between species in the same genus, which is indicated by the yellow part of these bars, is most of the variation. And so most of the variation that you see in distribution and abundance in species is, is, first of all, between very similar close relatives. Therefore, it doesn't seem like it could be the outcome of the particular conserved adaptations, many of which are shared by these close relatives within the same genus. If we look at morphology, we get much more like what we would expect, that there are uh, shared variation going all the way down through the taxonomic hierarchy, uh, even where a lot of this is like at the superfamily level in birds. So the point about this is the distribution of abundance are very labile. Okay, so similar species that are closely related, one can be abundant and widespread, another one being very localized. And this is a very common situation that's observed. Here are four species of hickory uh, in eastern North America. You can see their geographical ranges are quite different from one another, even though they're in the same genus. I can't tell them apart. I don't know. Um, but anyway, they're very similar to each other. And so one suspects that these differences in geography are not due to conserved 
adaptations which these species have. There's something else going on which is much more labile. And of course, I'll suggest that it has to do with relationships that these species have with various pathogens. So another thing that we can look at just sort of as natural historians is whether or not competition limits distribution and abundance. And certainly, experimentally, we know that competition is very important. Uh, there are limiting resources in nature which are being competed for. But the question is, does competition account for variation in distribution and abundance? So one way that, uh, going back to Darwin's idea that close relatives are the ones that compete most severely because they're the most similar, going back to that idea, we might predict that the abundance of any one particular species would be inversely related to the number of co-occurring close relatives. So if there are a lot of other similar species in the environment, they're going to be competing perhaps for similar resources, which is going to drive down the abundance of any one of those species to a lower level. So here's an example of how one might approach this. These are uh, bird census data from a 100 hectare plot in Peru, which John Turborg and his colleagues put together some time ago. Each one of these points is the average density of the species within a single family, in this case, of birds. And what you can see is that some of these families are quite large. So within this 100 hectare census area, there might be 20 or 30 species in the same family. The average abundance of any one of those species is no different than if there are many fewer competitors. So there doesn't seem to be any effect at all of having a lot of close relatives in the same forest using resources on the abundance of any particular species, suggesting me, or at least leading me to question whether or not competition or resources per se is actually causing this kind of a, of a relationship. We can see the same thing. These are data on pasturing birds in South America, number of habitats per species, number of zoogeographic zones going on even a little bit larger scale, and again, against number of species per family, and there's no statistical relationship between these. Same thing for trees on the number of 50 hectare forest plots. Absolutely no sensitivity of the abundance of a particular species to how many close relatives are in the same, and presumably stronger competitors are in the same place butterflies and tropical forest. It, it gets to be about you know, the same thing all the way along. So analyses like these suggest to me, other people may not agree with this, that competition is, although a strong force, all the resources are utilized, junk doesn't pile up in forests over centuries, uh, the resources are being utilized, but competition is not determining the abundance of particular species. So another kind of an uh, a way of looking at this is to look at the uh, distribution of uh, trees, for example. We're looking at temperate forests now uh, to see whether or not the uh, distributions of trees reflect uh, relationship in some way. And so if competition is a strong effect, closely related species should have different distributions. If adaptation to particular environments is important, and closely related species which have similar adaptations ought to be more similar in their distributions. And just as an example of how we might look at that, uh, a data set from the deciduous forest trees of eastern North America. Uh, this was published by Lucy Braun, who must have been an absolutely remarkable uh, person. She was the first uh, woman president of the Ecological Society of America, and a lot of firsts in that way. And during the Depression, she and her sister drove throughout all of eastern North America, they avoided the Gulf states for some reason. <laughs> <laughs> well, throughout here, sort of, sort of like, counting, enumerating the tree species on forest plots all, all over the area. And so it's a very nice uh, data set. And again, we have these two different alternatives we can think about is niche partitioning, that closely related species are present in different parts of the environment, or ecological sorting of closely related species with similar adaptations are using the same parts of the environment. And we can do an ordination. I don't want to go into the details of any of these are all forest plots, and you can ordinate as many axes as you want according to the distribution of species across these forest plots. And of course, the 
species at the same time also become ordinated. And so we can ask, for example, well, like here are oaks and hickories out at this end of the ordination. These are drier forests towards the west. But we can ask whether or not all of the distances between trees are greater within a family than between a family. Okay, so if the, if the individual species within a family are competing with each other, we would expect the species to be more distantly distributed to avoid that competition than species uh, in general across the entire forest. And here's what the results of these things look like. So these are all the comparisons. The within family comparisons in general are closer than the between family comparisons. If you do this at the generic level, you get the same result. So what this suggests, again, is that competition is not the dominating force here, because we should expect in that case that the comparisons within families would be more distant than the comparisons between families. But in fact, that it's adaptation to similar conditions, which is really predominating in the distribution of these trees, and that competition even though competition is a strong force, it is not actually determining the distributions of these. So anyway, the results of this suggest that ecological sorting is actually uh, sort of predominant over the effects of, of competition. So how are we going to account for all this variation in distribution and abundance? What is going on here? We can go back again to some of the old sages. Wallace said, the well-known fact that some species are very common while others are very rare is almost certain proof that one is better adapted to its position than the other. Presumably, he meant adaptation to the physical conditions of the environment in that particular case, although perhaps he had a broader concept in mind. Uh, John Willis, um, who was eventually the director of uh, Kew Gardens, uh, bot an English botanist, who is most famous for the book Age and Area, which I'm sure few of you have read, but you ought to read, even though it was widely derided at the time that it was published, for good reason. Um, but he said, he pointed out that, well, you know, there are all these species that are very, very locally distributed. This is not the entire range of the Monterey Cypress, but close to it. <laughs> you can plant anywhere in the world, and they grow just fine. So it doesn't seem like you can make the argument that it's adaptation to the very peculiar conditions along the far coast of California, um, which actually is limiting the distribution of this particular species. And so there's, there's a lot of uh, uh, uncertainty in terms of uh, sort of how species distributions are actually determined. And competition evidently plays a very, very minor role. And we're seeing this more and more because the invasion literature invasion ecology literature is full of examples of species being able to come into perfectly intact uh, environments and gain a, a strong foothold. So that also is suggesting that competition may not be what's going on. So what's happening? I mean, is this concept that we have firmly in our minds from, you know, from textbooks like mine uh, from some time ago, I mean, is this really the way we want to envision nature or not? And what I would suggest is, a, is an alternative which is like that, and all I've done is to sort of move these kind of uh, competitive ability lines a little bit further up, meaning that species are playing on a much more even playing field than <coughs> we might have thought about uh, in former times. Um, it's not quite Hubbellian, okay? I don't want to mean that species are completely neutral with respect to their ecology. There are still um, areas where a species will do better than other areas or other species. And so there is some differentiation in the ability of a species to occupy space uh, depending on the geography or the environmental conditions. But it's not as extreme as we see in these bell-shaped curves. And under this condition, if you get a slight change in productivity, so if we go from a situation where most of these species are, are very similar and one gets a couple of a percent increase in its overall productivity, its distribution can expand a lot because everybody is fairly evenly matched. So it may be that these very small changes in productivity might lead to very large changes in environmental and geographical 
distribution. So going back to this idea that almost all of this variation is between very closely related species, which presumably have very similar ecologies in some way, and some at any one time are extremely widely distributed, whereas a close relative may be extremely narrowly distributed. So if these phases of expansion or contraction, that is to say being widespread or being very narrowly distributed, are independent among closely related species, the causes probably depend on specialized agents, things that are specific to a particular species. And I think the most likely case here is pathogens. And each species is engaged in some kind of a co-evolutionary contest with pathogens. The advantage shifts back and forth between them, leading to phases of population expansion and population contraction. And of course, these expansion and contraction phases can occur independently of any change in the environment whatsoever. So we're not postulating that these are extrinsically driven changes, but rather they're intrinsic properties of the evolutionary nature of these regional communities. And this is, I think, a fairly interesting idea which has, uh, I think, implications which are, are going to be very interesting to follow up in some ways. So I would say these phases relate population dynamics to allopathic species formation because you might get expansion and contraction leaving behind isolated populations which then begin to evolve independently. And this connects diversity as is generated within regions to these regional characteristics. So this is a slightly or a much larger view of the way in which things are working. Now, these are, are ideas which I've been publishing during the last couple of years, but they go back in my own mind a long way uh, to a project that I undertook as a graduate student uh, at the University of Pennsylvania. I was, interestingly enough, I was discouraged in following this by MacArthur, who said, well, this is all kind of history, and how can you actually show anything? And I'll show you, he was right, and I'll show you, <laughs> show you what I mean by this. So if you look at the distributions, these are the Lesser Antilles. This is Trinidad, the, it's part of continental South America, and these are the Lesser Antilles. Uh, volcanic arc, which is just a, a wonderful group of islands. Um, and the distributions of just four exemplary species of birds, the gray kingbird is everywhere, even the smallest uh, island uh, in this area, and they're indistinguishable. So if you go into your museum drawers upstairs here, uh, you're not going to be able to tell which island any one of those specimens came from, except for the museum tag on it. Uh, here's an example of the house wren, which is relatively widely distributed. Uh, but in fact, uh, it's highly differentiated among the islands, and so you can tell immediately which islands. So these presumably have been evolving independently for some period of time. The Adelaide's warbler, which is now separated into different species, St. Lucia and Barbuda up here, about a million years of separation from these populations. We assume that populations filled in the intervening islands that have gone extinct over some period of time. And then here we get the Lesser Antillean bullfinch. This is an endemic to the Lesser Antilles found nowhere else. Presumably it originated on one of these islands and has re-expanded throughout the rest of this area. And of course these descriptions and my fertile imagination about what was happening here, I mean, was all fine, but there was no way to address that until the development of molecular methods which allowed us to get it phylogeography and so forth. So we have expansion, differentiation, fragmentation, and finally a re-expansion of this. This being a cycle which is going on all the time. Species expanding and contracting. Similar species ecologically may be in one phase or a different phase of the cycle at any given time. These are all idiosyncratic, at least as far as I can tell. The same process is almost undoubtedly going on within large continental regions as well as in archipelagos like this where you can see it very easily because of the discrete nature of these islands. So quite a geographic analysis that I've done largely with Eldridge Birmingham who was at the Smithsonian for a long time uh, suggests that these so-called taxon cycle phases, a, a phrase borrowed from Ed Wilson, might last hundreds of thousands of years. So there's a large time component. Um, I think they almost certainly occur within continental regions, and you can see the signals of that in individual populations quite easily. And again, because the phase is unrelated to a species ecology, 
uh, the driver that probably specializes in the case of pathogens. So this is uh, my guess about what's going on. Of course, we don't really have very much direct evidence bearing on that. Um, but I spent quite a bit of time working, about also my students, uh, working on a radiation of birds in the West Indies, which are the Cerebini, uh, the banana quit being sort of the flagship species of this. But these are all birds that have diversified within the West Indies. It's not quite as impressive as the Hawaiian honey creepers or maybe the gall. Yes, yeah, it's better than the gall. It's interesting. <laughs> <laughs> more colorful, for God's sake. Not only that, not only that, they're the ones that gave rise to the gall. And so it was species coming out of the West Indies, going into South America, and being the ancestors of the eventual colonists of the Galapagos Islands and the radiation of finches there. So it's a fantastic uh, radiation in some ways. So I've looked at the blood parasites, the hemospiridium blood parasites, which you might think of as malaria parasites. These birds, most birds around here have them. Uh, they're very common parasites of birds. They are vectored by various different insects. Uh, and just getting some idea of what the actual sort of distribution of these uh, pathogens in this case, they're known in some experimental studies to have rather detrimental effects on health. But interestingly enough, so these are all islands going from the Greater Antilles all the way through to Grenada, which is the southern end of the Lesser Antilles. And you can see that you know, on any one island, these are all different lineages of parasites. Some of them are closely related, some of them are distantly related, but they're distinct evolutionary lineages. And you can see that they vary from island to island, back and forth. There are big disjunctions and distributions uh, in many of these things. There seems probably to be some interaction between these, because rarely do you get two really common uh, lineages on the same island. I mean, this is an incredibly complex distribution of pathogens over a single bird species. And interestingly enough, we know from phylogeographic analyses that between St. Lucia and uh, all the lesser Antilles, all the way to the Virgin Islands, this is a very, very recent radiation of birds. So these have all spread throughout these, uh, throughout these islands from the south over a very, very short period of time. But the, the complexity of it is, is really kind of remarkable. I tried to come up with a, with a phrase to describe sort of this type of, of uh, investigation and portrayal of data. And I thought pathogeography sounded pretty good. <laughs> um, but it turns out, if you Google pathogeography, <laughs> you see, I can't understand any of this, but it's all along the situation with psychogeography that substitutes pathos and so, and so forth. <laughs> I thought that was kind of a California thing. And, uh, so I tried instead geopathology, and that's, you know, it was a reasonable thing to look at. But it turns out <laughs> geopath geopathic stress, I don't know if you felt this or not, is a form of permanent stress caused by noxious earth energy. <laughs> I tell you, the point terms is getting to be more and more difficult. <laughs> So anyway, all I can say is that we have the distribution of these parasites among a, a single host species in this case. There are other interesting things that come out of this. For example, this is one parasite, Vinyad OZ21, OZ21, which we first found in the Ozarks in Missouri, by the way. Uh, its prevalence in Lesser Antillean bullfinch and its presence in the banana quid, they seem to be somewhat re uh, inversely related to each other, suggesting some kind of you know, competitive interactions among the immune system of these two species. Uh, they're replaced by other lineages on different islands. Uh, so, for example, on Antigua and Barbuda, they're very low in the wolf inches, which get in other lineages. And on Grenada, the lineage doesn't exist, and it's replaced by another lineage from some world. So all these complexities seem to come in here and indicate that we're dealing with an extremely dynamic system, although we really don't understand the basics for these dynamics very well. Are we frozen? No. Okay. We are interested, of course, in whether or not, I mean, this is a kind of a model system just to see what distribution of pathogens are like, but we were interested in seeing if we can detect any population uh, consequences of these pathogens. So, for example, this is the frequency of a particular lineage, OZ1, uh, going from a very, well, none detected in the samples we have up to as much as 10% of the pathogens on a particular island that we've 
sample. And these are the frequency of two host species, the banana quid and the black faced grass quid. So these are somewhat related in this uh, one clade of cerebrum. And what you can see is there is a significant decrease in the population, the relative sizes of these populations on islands as the frequency of this particular lineage increases. This is a statistical relationship. I mean, interestingly enough, this particular parasite rarely shows up in either of these two species. And that's possibly because those species can't tolerate the parasite and either die or are sitting sick somewhere and don't fly anymore in this nest. Uh, again, we don't know very much about this, but it's an indication that these lineages actually do have some kind of a population consequence, which might in fact be related to expansion versus contraction within an area. These are only one type of disease, of course. I mean, birds, as all other organisms, are beset by all kinds of things. This is an extremely complex area uh, in which it's going to take a long time, I think, and a lot of investigation, including experimentation, to be able to really work through to you know, some kind of a conclusion. And yet, it's all, it's all kind of uh, encouraging to me, anyway, that there may actually be something to this uh, co-evolutionary or counter-evolutionary uh, relationship between host populations or any kind of a population and its various pathogens which are leading to these cycles of expansion and contraction. So we can summarize some of this stuff just by saying that competitive interactions are broadly diffuse within regional ecological communities and so the species are acting on approximately a level playing field, not completely level of course, but so that small changes in relationships with pathogens or other agents which are causing variation in the productivity of a population will lead to these alternating phases of population expansion and contraction and perhaps determine the distribution and abundance of species within areas and also drive diversification within these regions. So I'm going to leave you with this, with a, a set of uh, speculations and ideas which have uh, come to me sort of out of you know, natural history curiosity about how these various patterns were actually uh, produced and what they represent and sort of uh, using some of the things that I learned in school about evolution and ecology to uh, try and create a, a scenario at least which is worth developing hypotheses for and for generating additional uh, research. I don't know what 10 years from now, uh, what we will look at and what we will actually say. People may look back at this as another foolish idea. Um, but on the other hand, I think these are the kinds of things that really deserve exploring. Pathogens are kind of the big black box in ecology, right? They've really uh, had very little attention until very, very recently. And so all I can say is that if I'm right, uh, it's going to be a very different way of interpreting regional communities and local communities. And if I'm wrong, it's been fun. <laughs> <laughs>
generalization and specialization, but there certainly are specialists out there. And I think that's being found more and more in the tree diversity literature now, where a lot of uh, this is being related to uh, pathogens which are reducing the abundance of species and allowing others to coexist. And so many of those are specialized on tree species in that case. So there has to be some Yes? Um, how do you think the, uh, dif the differences in the lifespan of the parasite and the lifespan of her, you know, two reproductive uh, yeah. age, uh, do you, and how do you think that impacts if you see differences between long-lived uh, tree species and short-lived birds? Yeah, I mean, parasites already evolve really fast, right? I and mean, that's what everybody says. Hey, what's, what's the evidence for that? I mean, certainly... The flu. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Certainly certain types of things like that are, are evolving extremely fast. But there are other kinds of parasites which are uh, have lifespans which are actually not so different from you know, their hosts. Malaria, avian malaria, for example. First of all, the population side, the populations in any individual are pretty much a clone. And so we're not talking about lots of individuals there. We're talking about a clone, which is sort of one organism. And the lifespans of those, since these uh, infections can last just about the lifespan of a bird, that they may be very similar in terms of their lifespan. So for that particular pathogen, maybe they're reasonably well balanced in terms of their evolutionary prospects, in terms of you know, fighting. The other thing which I think is, uh, which was brought up by somebody earlier today, is that we often think about these coevolutionary relationships as a, as a bunch of uh, uh, virulence genes and a bunch of resistance genes that are kind of cycling very rapidly through uh, some strong you know, selective uh, regime in a population. And the classic idea of these coevolutionary relationships is sort of built on those kinds of models. But it's also possible that, with, I mean, that would produce cycles of a very short period of time, much shorter than what we're looking at here, which are hundreds of thousands of years probably. But this also, these relationships may also depend on rare mutations that don't come along, but you know, once every, 100,000 generations of you know, some very long time in the world. So it's very hard to know what are the genetic factors that are actually looking at this and what their time uh, periods are going to be like. So that didn't answer your question. Uh, it, it, it's, it's a good start. Uh, <laughs> just like, if, if you think more maybe the lag times between the uh, if you get if, you, if your cycling would be different, uh, if you get like right. uniform distribution with a really fast uh, cycle time, if you have longer lag, you might start to see the right. patterns that you're seeing. Right. So, so it may be it may be very very unique genetic events which <coughs> actually resulting in these changes in uh, productivity of population one way or the other. Yes. So with these kinds of work, given you know how much you've done in the in the Caribbean uh, system. Um, what about the vectors? Do you have any information on sort of the diversity of the vectors, the sort of intermediate step? Yeah, we, we don't have any details about which vector, if there's any specialization of vectors. The mosquitoes and, and midges and other biting insects that are responsible for vectoring these pathogens are pretty well known, but not the actual disease relationships. So we know about the distributions of the insects. And they're also they're very broadly distributed across these islands, and it's not too likely that they that the insect vectors themselves are causing these variations in distribution. And the diversity of the vectors relative to, for example, the diversity of the birds in any one island? Uh, yes, that's a good question, and I don't have the answer to that. Across the Lesser Antilles, the diversities are fairly similar, um, because most of those birds, are get, once they get in there, they spread through most of the island. So uh, they're fairly similar. So I wouldn't expect that there's really much of a relationship one way or the other. Certainly, as you go from temperate to tropical areas, you're getting you know, substantial changes in diversity. And those are going to make the tropical systems probably much more complex in a lot of ways. But we've looked at uh, malaria parasites in both temperate and tropical communities in some detail. And the number of parasites per host species and the number of host species infected per parasite are almost exactly the same, not statistically different between temperate and tropical areas. There's more of each, but we're not talking about more specialization or less specialization in either one of these. Either one of these. Yes? Uh, I, I like your uh, emphasis on the pathogens, but um, it seems to me that there 
all these focal species that you may be working on are interacting with lots of other unrelated species as well, as, as right. kind of hinted at by some of the other questions. It seems like the way that species closely related to birds or whatever are re related to some of these other unrelated species may be different. Right? And therefore, you, these could also impact how, good, how well adapted they are to the complex. Yeah. Do, do you agree with that? I would, I would the nature is complex. I would agree with that for sure. Yeah. But that shouldn't prevent us from trying to tease it out to uh -huh. some person. Yeah, it could be very complex. Yes? Well, just a, a simple follow up on Bill's question. Um, I think that. Um, could you comment on how often bird populations are limited by predators? And I, my impression is not very much compared to things like insects. So uh, an old view that I've heard is that um, insects um, don't compete with each other very much because birds are limiting them. And, and birds compete with each other because they're food limited or you know, nest site limited or resource limited. But that would also make them sitting ducks, as it were, to be more um, <laughs> disease limited, if they're, especially if they're aggregated, than a, than a predator limited taxon. So are there any broad patterns that could help predict at that scale? Yeah, that's a, uh, insects don't eat everything, right, that's available to them. This mm -hmm. is sort of the, the green earth thing that's yeah. something that was brought up many, many years ago. And so the idea is they must be limited because they're not consuming all their resources. Birds may be closer to the resource limitations, it's very hard to, hard to know actually about that. Um, yeah, uh, I don't know that that really matters. But what really matters is the relative productivity of these competing populations. And so getting an edge within a given system is going to allow a species to increase and even begin to spread geographically as a result of that which may be related to small differences in predation rates even, but also in parasitism rates. So I'm not quite sure how to actually you know, answer that question. Are birds limited by predators? I doubt it. I mean, they're affected, they're impacted by predators for sure, but I don't know if the populations have been shown to be limited in the same way by predators. That is, you eliminate predators and the population of Disease is often limited by density of the hosts. So that's why it would follow well, this is another curious fact about diseases. Usually when there are more and more host higher densities, the diseases do better, right? Yep. And so they have a tendency exactly. perhaps to begin to knock back the host population because yeah. of contagion. Yep. Uh, again, in natural populations, this is not well researched. Mm -hmm. in some way. So another area to go after. Yes. I was wondering if you think that there might be, you know, intra-avian competition among, between the various pathogens, you know, like the various parasites. Do you think that that could be, you know, a factor as to why you may only get like one or two, you know, parasites within an individual bird that the pathogens are actually competing within the organism for, you know, the host sites? You do get mixed infections for sure. Um, but on the other hand, the pathogens are interacting through the immune system of their host as well. And so the host may actually depress one pathogen, which gives another one an advantage. And so this is something which is going to change probably over evolutionary time. Um, yeah, I mean, what, what more can I say about it than, than that? That's certainly going to be a factor which is involved. They are competing in some sense, and how that competition works, probably not through the bird as a resource, at least for malaria parasites but maybe through the immune system as a way of fighting that. Yeah. So, in that context, these organisms that have adaptive immune systems, the adaptive immune system is a mechanism for specialization. Right. So, do you think this kind of pattern is going to be more commonly found mm -hmm. among organisms with adaptive, adaptive immune systems? systems? Yeah, that's a good question. Are insects going to show the same thing? Mm -hmm. It's a good <laughs> That's a good point. Yeah. One more thing for some bright young graduate student to get on to. Yeah, I was just trying to think how, how are you going to test this in a very general way? I, mean, you know, yeah. I guess what you want is a time machine where you can look at, at distributions of communities yeah. over time and, and distributions of pathogens in those same communities over time. 
So we, we can see changes in communities in part through some of the resurveys of museum collections. Do you, I mean, do you think that this could be relevant for thinking about these ideas? So, so we have a little bit of a handle on that. For example, in the West Indies, some of these islands are land bridge islands that were connected during the Pleistocene sea level lows, and presumably their pathogen communities were homogenized at that time, at least over similar distances within intact islands, they are homogenized. And so over a period of two to 5,000 years, we can see how much differentiation has taken place between the pathogen communities in two different areas where the hosts are essentially the same and undifferentiated. You do get striking changes in, over those periods. So we know a little bit about the time course of this. We also have now samples over 20 or more years from the same locations in the islands. And there are some changes. Occasionally, a particular lineage of pathogen will be very much reduced in numbers over that period of time or uh, will disappear entirely. So on a lot of different scales, we're seeing, at least in this particular system, that is birds and avian malaria, we're seeing a lot of heterogeneity and temporal change in these, in these communities. Quite striking. We don't have any idea what the underlying mechanisms for causes of this harm. Maybe a few more questions. Sorry. People want to get to the second and start drinking. <laughs> <laughs> So it seemed like when you were looking at the at these systems and asking whether or not there was a signature competition, that by selecting systems where there were sympatry relationships, that those would be the ones that are less likely to show competition. And if you were looking at systems where there's parapathic distributions, where you know, these gene right. like distributions, that there's probably more likely to be competition there. And I'm wondering if there's any opportunity in drawing comparisons between those two types of systems with these pathogen relationships, that there's an expected difference there when you test your hypothesis, or if this, you just expect the same thing. Uh, it's an interesting suggestion, I don't know what you expect. I don't know what you expect. We should even talk about that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, maybe one, one more question. One more. Uh, uh, one I can answer. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. One of the things that's great about this system, the fact of disease, is its potential to experiment with the population level. I know you've done experiments that show that individual differences in the population. Yes. Right. Do you think it's possible to start curing with these populations? No, yeah, I mean, one would like to go in with anti malarials, for example, and clean up a population. The populations are pretty big. I don't know whether. That would be practical or it could be permitted uh, on the scale that we have you know, on these islands. I mean, also, I mean, another thing which would be very interesting to me is to actually move birds from one island into aviaries on another island to see whether they picked up diseases which they're not getting on the other island. And that would be a more practical experiment, you know, if you're very careful not to let anything go. And with regard to this, one of the most curious situations in the West Indies that exists. The banana quit, which is one of these cerebrini birds, the most common bird in the West Indies, goes all the way into uh, South America, where it's an abundant species almost everywhere. It is missing from the island of Cuba. It's not a political statement. I mean, it, is, <laughs> it hasn't been there for a long time. And it occurs on some of the caves, little islets off the north coast. So it's seen there, so it reaches there. Um, it almost certainly was the uh, island through which the Bahamas birds passed into Central America. Uh, these pilots very geographically, we know that. But it doesn't occur there, and neither does the black faced grassfoot, and neither does there's one other member of this thing. They're everywhere else in the Caribbean except on that one island. And my guess is that there's a pathogen on that island that they can't take. But one would have to do the experiment to take birds into those islands, you have to do it in any of the areas, you can be very careful about this, but it would be possible to take a look at some of these anomalies in distribution uh, to see what's going on. Some curious facts. Right? I remember McCarthy used to say, well, there is a red-legged honey creeper on Cuba, which also does, you know, it's a nectar feeder and so forth, and it's competition, which is keeping the bad out. So I was on Cuba a couple of years ago, I didn't see a red-legged red honey creeper. I don't think that's what's having any effect whatsoever.
And they're, of course, all over the mainland where they're going to be all over the place. Who knows? Very interesting. Well, if, if you have uh, more questions for Bob, please come to the reception tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you.